However, today I'm going to talk again, um, following up, it's a bit of a hard act to follow up Trevor. Um, he's done a very comprehensive study, but um, I'm sorry you've got another science nerd to talk to you now, so <laughs> apologise, get your phones out, start Googling stuff you're interested in. Um, <coughs> so this is a little picture of what mycoplasma looks like when it's growing on um, agar, and it looks a bit like a poached egg, and the reason why we don't bother growing it is because it takes a really long time, and people keep having sex while you're busy growing it and spreading. So we, we've decided that it's much better to PCR it real quick and get results out to you guys so you can treat people. So this is a bit of a study that um, uh, will, will tell you why no test is 100%. So um, for a bit of a disclosure, um, just want to let you know that um, Hologic uh, were very kind to fund uh, Massey University for the study. Speedex Australia were kind enough to also provide some reagents. And just to let you know, I have previously received um, conference and travel funding um, and honoraria from Roche, although they have nothing to do with this. Um, doing research in New Zealand is hard. It's hard to get money, so I'm really grateful to the sponsors that support my research. So, um, the usual symptoms of an MG infection. That kicked in the nuts feeling. <laughs> the pissing razor blades feeling, pardon me. And what I call the asymptomatic case. And of course, it's a problem because <laughs> I use these exact same slides when I give talks about chlamydia and talks about gonorrhea because it's, it can look like a lot of other STIs, so it's a bit of a problem to try and diagnose. You can't tell someone's got it by looking at them. Um, but MG is a great bug because it has superpowers, and I love to tell my students about this. So because it's got no cell wall, it can bend into funny shapes, and I do believe someone bent it into that. That is a joke, people. You're allowed to laugh. Um, <laughs> Because it doesn't have a cell wall, and penicillins and cephalosporins target cell walls and punch holes in them and make the bugs explode, it has intrinsic resistance to that group of antibiotics. So you're screwed from the start with those ones. Um, and of course, it attended the school of antibiotic resistance with the Neisseria cohort. So it is accumulating resistant mutations in its genome at the same rate <laughs> that gonorrhea does, and that's what makes it bloody scary out there in the clinic. Um, this is my favourite cartoon about um, antibiotic resistance, and it's actually done by the lecturer who's in, in the office next to me. His name is Nick Kim, you can Google him, Lab Initio, and he has lots of science cartoons, and they're all free to download, so go for it, guys. Good for talks. Um, so here's another interesting thing that I found a few years ago, and this is, might be kind of hard to see. But um, mycoplasmas can actually hide inside other eukaryotic organisms to avoid antibiotics. So despite their small genome, they're really clever. So this is a, it's a pretty old study actually, it's 2006. Um, this is a culture of trichomonads, and the little red dots that you can see, so I've got the shakes today, we've had much to drink last night, sorry. Um, <laughs> So what they've done is they've flooded this culture of trichomonades with gentamicin, and the mycoplasma that were also coexisting in that culture shot inside the trichomonads and lived on and survived the gentamicin. So this raises the possibility that if you've got a patient who has a coexisting infection with trichomonads and you're treating them even with the right antibiotics for the genotype of those mycoplasma, that they're going to avoid the antibiotics at the same time and you will have this repeated visits from this patient with symptoms. Just a thought to chuck out there. So um, we had a, um, a study that we decided to do. It was a sub-study of a larger one that was done by Dr. Arlo Upton um, of Lab Test Auckland uh, on the basis that the uh, prevalence and, and the antibiotic resistance of uh, mycoplasma in the whole of New Zealand was unknown and it's unmonitored. So at the moment, ESR is not funded to monitor MG. We don't know who should be tested for MG really anyway. Um, do we screen everybody or just those who are symptomatic? So um, she had a cohort of um, just over two and a half thousand clinical samples and uh, she um, put those samples through the um, Panther platform and tested them for a number of STIs, including um, Mycoplasma genitalium. And she sent those samples down to me, um, and we did some work on them, and the aim was to look at um, how good the SpeedX kit was for detecting resistance. So this is a complicated slide. This is me trying to summarize my study. A whole lot of swabs, they went, to the panther, it told us who was positive for mycoplasma. 
Now, what the panther does in the name of preventing contamination is it does a Kim Jong-il style nuke of everything at the end of the test. And so you can't get any DNA out to do lots of other stuff on. So I had to re-extract, that's a picture of me doing cool stuff in the lab. And uh, <laughs> sort of chuck that in there. Uh, <laughs> and so some of that DNA went off and, and got sequenced, and some of that DNA went onto the light cycler and was tested by the SpeedX assay for the presence of mycoplasma and also for the, God damn it, got my ribosomal RNA genes mixed up, the 23 S RNA mutations. Sorry, SpeedX, I do know what I'm doing. Um, and then we basically compared the genotype that we got from sequencing with the kit. So um, just to give you a few quick results, from Arlo's biggest study, we know that the people that we were testing, they had a high rate of co-infections with other STIs. So 23% of them had another STI. So there's that TV, there's that trike infection. It likes to go in there with trike. It does also like to go in there with chlamydia. And I do get this kind of spooky feeling, because it's been around a while, that we are now where we were about 15 years ago with chlamydia, <laughs> when we started really PCRing the heck out of chlamydia and going, God, it's everywhere. Um, okay, so when we put it through, put our samples through the SpeedX assay, um, we managed to detect mycoplasma in 61% of them. Um, so this shows you there's a bit of difference in sensitivity between the Aptima assay and the SpeedX assay, they're two different tests. You don't always get concordance when you put two different tests together. So this is possibly an issue for people who would be referring samples from one part of the country where they're not doing uh, mycoplasma genotyping to Canterbury Health Laboratories where they are as a referral test. Um, this is a similar result to what a recent study from France pulled out. Um, but we're also unsure if it's to do with the fact that the samples were pretty old and, you know, and I was playing with them in the lab. However, um, in terms of resistance, we're looking similar rates to what Trevor just showed you. About 60% about 60, 60 was susceptible, about 42% resistant. So that seems scary, but that's 60% of your patients that if you've got the right information, you can still give them a macrolide antibiotic, and that's the important bit. Um, I'm going to whiz past that. Basically, that slide, if anybody wants my slides afterwards, gives you a bit of demographics about who had a mutation and who didn't by age and by gender. Um, and then if we, this is a complicated table. Um, this shows you the comparison between sequencing and the SpeedX results. Um, essentially, there were discrepant detections. We had um, particularly eight samples that were uh, mycoplasma positive by SpeedX that couldn't be sequenced. So again, you get swings and roundabouts. But there was generally broad agreement between the two methods on 80% of the samples. Um, what we did find when we compared the sequencing was that the SpeedX had miscalled um, about seven of the genotypes. One was miscalled as being resistant when it was actually susceptible. Um, and six samples were miscalled as susceptible when they were actually resistant. But the overall sensitivity for macrolide resistance was 83%, very strong specificity. So, um, when we had a bit of a look at it, and we, you know, Trevor showed you a nice table of all these different random genotypes, what we do know is that we have a decreasing rate of the presence of the genotypes that the SpeedX assay finds it hardest to detect. So it may be that in our cohort, we have a challenging group of mutations for that test to detect, unsure of the implications of that. So, in terms of the feasibility of this, um, if you are going to be running um, a high throughput platform where you want one swab that will give you chlamydia, gonorrhea, trike, and mycoplasma, then the Aptima platform will do that for you with extremely high sensitivity with random access, and it works really, really well. You can take that sample and put it through as a reflex on that, thank you, um, on the SpeedX, um, MG Res Plus kit to get your macrolide resistance genotype. Um, for a reasonably fast turnaround, you can put those samples through automated DNA extraction platforms. So you do need that interim step because of the, the nuking of the DNA. Um, Hologic does have a research use only assay coming for that Panther platform, which would tag on and give macrolide resistance detection. Um, so that might be an, an, an option in the future. Um, 
However, um, there are some pitfalls to doing antimicrobial genotyping overall that I want to draw out. This is my, fav my other favourite picture. This um, apparently means sex is a little bit dangerous in Serbian. It's quite, quite evocative, isn't it? It's obviously Photoshop, but how cool is that? Um, <laughs> so you will get discordance between Aptima and SpeedX MG results, but you will get discordance when you put two tests together and run them head to head any time. Um, laboratory reports, though, do need to emphasise the possibility of incorrect results, and, and that is written and prescribed in the ISO um, that you need to put um, your measurement of uncertainty in those results so that clinicians know that that is not a lock, stock and barrel, and if that does not correlate with what you're seeing in your patient, you need to question it. Um, I also want to point out that genotype does not always equal phenotype. So you can get mixed infections going on, and I believe Jenny Haywood is going to give a talk after me that will maybe even muddy the water slightly more um, when you especially get multiple patients involved. Um, so do, do be aware that what you have in front of you on your patient means sometimes way more than what's on the lab report. Um, and if you do get partner discordance and susceptibility results where you have one partner is resistant, one comes back susceptible, there's the possibility that one of those results is wrong. Retest. Retest until you get a clear picture. So, in my summary, <coughs> family planning advice. Use the rear entrance. Um, <laughs> there is, that's a real one, yeah. Northampton General Hospital. You here from the UK? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so there's, there's always a gap between performance of screening assays versus specific uh, genotyping assays and no test out there has 100% performance. Try and, if you take nothing else away from this, just remember that. We, we in the lab, we, we do our best but we can't always give you perfection. Um, the SpeedX assay is extremely user friendly, it's, I mean it's putting six assays essentially into one and there couldn't be anything easier than that, um, even I managed to do it. Um, and uh, it gave us good sensitivity and, and excellent specificity for macrolide resistance mutations. Um, if you have a test result that is discrepant and affecting your patient management, do retest it. And really do not underestimate the ability of Mycoplasma genitalium to ruin your day. <laughs> so I would like to thank um, Arlo Upton from Lab Test in Auckland who initiated the study. Peter Lowe from Hologic, who is a data analysis god and helped me with my complicated Excel sheets. Uh, Dr. Litty Tan from SpeedX, who is a light cycler ninja and came over and went and got my light cycler going and whoa. Um, Karishma Dio, who was my lab technician ever so briefly. Um, Lizelle Bicesa, who's a scientist from Lab Test Auckland. And um, again, thank you to Hologic and SpeedX for the funding. That's our website. We've got a moment for a question. It's okay, I will be here at morning tea time. Oh, you have a question? Okay. <laughs> That's a, that's a wonderful question and I have no idea how to answer that, um, short of if we did whole genome sequencing and, and tried to kind of do you know, snazzy stuff that ESR does to figure out where things come from and interrelatedness between them. Um, in terms of uh, what have you tried treating them with? Lots. Lots. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think they're living on Cipro now, they live on Cipro. They otherwise, live on Cipro. Yes, otherwise they come and sit in my waiting room and demand to be examined. Wow. And, and if you take them off it, they're symptomatic. And the nurses thought they were there to be, you know, to see, you, the, see the woman, but they're symptomatic. Yeah. Are you in Canterbury? Have you been? I'm in Taranaki, which oh, is you're a, in Taranaki. It's a, it's a wee bit tough to get testing. Isn't it? So um, I would recommend getting a sample off them and trying to get it sent down to Trevor. Um, down at Canterbury Health Laboratories yeah, because he's, I think I might. He, he's one of he's doing the great testing down here and really getting into the complicated stuff. They sound stuff. like that could be resistant. That might be why. That, that might be multiply resistant. Um, and yeah, um, and you're probably best to talk to a real clinician rather than a science nerd. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> thank thank you very very much. You're welcome. Yeah.